Hey everyone, welcome back to Life at Geisinger. I am joined here by my colleague and co-host Chris Grill. Hey Grace, is it uh, is it too late to say Happy New Year? I know we're into February already, but uh, it's our never, first podcast of the new year. Never, never too late to say Happy New Year to our listeners. And what a new year it is. We're Definitely. all hoping. Good stuff. So uh, in today's podcast, we're actually going to be joined by uh, Bobby Hicks. Um, Bobby and I had an opportunity to, to sit down with Arthur Breeze this month to talk about um, all the cool things that we're going to be doing here at Geisinger for Black History Month. Um, sorry we left you out of that, Chris. No offense. Uh, I don't think you were available. No, yeah, it, it's great. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing your conversation with Arthur and um, all the topics that you and Bobby get into. So, I mean, you mentioned your discussion with, with Arthur, and, and it is February um, so it's Black History Month, so uh, the nation and, and Geisinger are, are using the time and, and celebrating Black History Month and reflecting on um, the contributions of the, the Black community and, and how Black history really impacts our, our lives today. Um, so really looking forward to hearing that conversation with Arthur. Absolutely. I mean, it was such a great discussion. We hope all of you, the listeners, uh, really enjoy this. We certainly did. We talk a lot about equity. Um, diversity, inclusion, as you mentioned, all the work that's going on right now here in the system, its impact on our community. Um, really nice time to kind of step back and, and take a moment to reflect on um, all of the impacts that all of the Geisinger members. So he talks about um, our students, our medical students, um, our, our members, our patients, um, and certainly our employees and the opportunities of outreach that we have to impact each and every one of those areas on a daily basis. And we're doing that. So really hope that you guys all enjoy. It's a great conversation. Arthur's a heck of a storyteller. Um, so without further ado, let's introduce our guest. Welcome, Arthur, to the podcast. Thank you, Grace. It's good to be here. Good to have you. So Arthur, um, we wanted to bring you on the show. We've got a, a base of listeners um, that range from employees to maybe even folks outside of Geisinger. Um, and we were hoping to just kick us off here with a little bit of a background um, of what your role is in the system and how it came about to be and um, some of the things you're currently working on. Yeah, so um, I had the wonderful opportunity about 14 years ago uh, to join the uh, Geisinger family. Um, prior to that, I was the uh, director of the Diversity Institute at Misericordia University, and there was a Blue Ribbon grant um, that we had Misericordia had with a number of um, healthcare um, organizations in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and I met Margaret uh, Heffers and Wenda Hartzell. Um, and they happened to be part of that class, and which was really great. And we taught them a little uh, bit about cultural competency in healthcare. And we did a train the trainer model, never thinking that there was an opportunity or that Geisinger would ever be looking for someone to oversee their uh, diversity initiatives. Um, so with that said, um, a while down the road, about maybe five years after that, um, Margaret had reached out to me and said, hey, look, we're looking for someone um, to oversee our diversity and inclusion initiatives at Geisinger. Um, Wenda has done such a great job, but she really needs to manage her um, organizational development role. And I was really nervous. I didn't think that I should actually take it um, because I was doing so well at the Diversity Institute. But I said, well, why not? You know, I'm a risk taker. So I decided to apply for the job and uh, was shocked that I even got a phone call um, to come in for a second interview and then um, had the offer. Um, so since then, I've been overseeing all the diversity initiatives um, across the system. When I first came in, it really was about compliance, accreditation, making sure that we had our, our affirmative action plans in place, um, that we were meeting the accrediting bodies such as JACO and Magnet status, to now where diversity, equity, and inclusion is strategically tied to every function of our business um, at Geisinger. So it's been a really exciting opportunity. Um, I, I don't even call it a job because I just love it so much. Um, and it seems almost like my hobby or my personal passion. So thank you. 
Well, we're lucky to have you. Certainly, you have just you know leveraged again the DE and I um, programming and framework at this organization, um, and you've got gotten to partner with a lot of um, cool folks in our organization. Can you tell us a little bit about um, who you partner with currently, and and some of your favorite memories uh, and milestones at Geisinger? Yeah, one of my favorite memories, and Grace, thank you for the, you're giving me some really good questions. One of my favorite memories uh, was having the opportunity to write a um, rationale for why we should be doing um, everyday bias. And so I had the wonderful opportunity, um, gosh, about four or five years ago, um, where I um, had the ability to attend at a, the AAMC conference, um, and I met this uh, wonderful person called Howard Ross, um, who was facilitating an everyday bias course. I was in such awe after that, and I'm thinking, my mind, I couldn't even sleep that night. My mind was going and figuring out, how do I get this entrenched at Geisinger? So I wrote a rationale paper to our chief human resource officer, Amy Brafer, and I said, look, I said, we got to do this. I said, here are the reasons why. Put all the business imperatives together with the triple aim of healthcare, all the reasons why you would want to do it. And um, I was shocked uh, a couple of days after she said, sure, let's do it. And I'm thinking, OK, so the train the trainer everyday bias um, has really been um, one of my successes, which I'm extremely proud about. The second was um, implementing um, our employee resource groups because we know um, employee resource groups are important to recruitment, retention, your marketing, um, your brand enhancement, and then training and employee development. And so um, got them to agree to let's start a, a woman's ERG because we were founded by Abigail Geisinger. And the exciting thing was is um, I'll never forget when we were doing all this research, we found out that Abigail Geisinger um, had uh, made a endowment to a historically black college, Cheney University. Nice. Now, how exciting was that for um, someone in rural Pennsylvania to actually do that um, and a woman of her um, stature? Mm -hmm. So we thought this is a great opportunity since we're three quarters of an organization that's female. Let's start there. The other is, is that the opportunity is really, I get to work with everyone. Um, I, you know, who gets to touch everyone? And I think about, even though I don't do direct care, I'm indirectly impacting patient care, which Absolutely. I think is so important. Absolutely. And now with this, yeah. And now with the School of Medicine, um, we've really, I know a lot of our programs have even a further outreach in, um, you know, the future um, providers in our state, in our country, um, and in, and incorporated and embedding into their training. So that's pretty cool as well too, since we've incorporated School of Medicine into our, our health system. I am working with their Director of Diversity and Student Engagement, Dr. Vicki Sapp. Mm -hmm. And part of what I've been involved in is being part of multiculturalizing their courses to ensure that when the students graduate, that they will be culturally competent health practitioners. And so finding out how to multiculturalize their courses to make sure that it teaches to different diverse, uh, diverse learning styles, um, hearing those diverse uh, stories, telling the historical perspectives of patients that they will treat um, is so important for them to understand, you know, that, you know, you just don't treat everyone the same, that you really have to know them and once you know them, then they can begin to trust you, and then you could be much more effective at um, treating their illness that brought them in. Arthur, some of the ERGs, the employee resource groups that you just discussed, would you mind sharing with us what the names are of those groups for employees who might be interested in learning more or getting involved? Yeah, so the first uh, employee resource group is called Women Lead, and uh, the second that we started was Bold. Um, which stands for Black Outreach Leadership Development. The third is our VetNet group, um, which Chris has done a tremendous job. He's the uh, co-chair of that. The fourth is um, G Pride, which is our uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. And the last is GAIN, which is our uh, people with disabilities um, employee resource group. Um, anyone, in fact, 
it is uh, incredibly important that if you don't belong to the ERG, if you don't share that identity, you should absolutely immerse yourself into that ERG. Um, because one of the ways to mitigate your biases is perspective taking. And so often we are always, um, you know, are hanging around people that are similar to us. And so we don't get to hear those other voices. So one of the ways to do that, uh, to mitigate your biases, is to uh, perspectives taking. So anyone, we always encourage everyone to uh, um, really join as many as they can. Um, you could do it three ways. One is you can go on Yammer, um, which is um, probably the best way to do it, and sign up for each of the ERGs. Um, they all have their own um, meetings, general body meetings um, that take place. Um, all of them have different subcommittees. Um, for example, Bolt has an educational committee. They have a welcoming committee. In fact, um, really exciting, we're now putting together a welcoming packet. Um, Bold um, took this on where we will um, send a welcoming letter um, to each of the members that identify as Black African American when they first start, and then they will get a name of an ambassador. And that ambassador will be with them for 30 to 60 days to make sure that whatever they're going through in the uh, first 30 to 60 days at Geisinger, um, they don't feel comfortable about whatever performance evaluation or how they're doing in their area, um, that ambassador will be their ambassador for that particular time. Um, the second way that you can get involved in is, is that we do have um, opportunities to people to serve on the committees. Um, and I think that's probably the really most important way to do that. Um, we've always been doing all of our uh, meetings uh, done uh, virtually, um, but I must say the one of the things that I've been really disappointed on is we've got to get our hourly engaged employees um, more involved in that. And I think um, I have some um, ideas of how to do that. I think we really need to start um, engaging our managers, leaders in those areas, um, because that's the group that we want to retain the most. And we often see a lot of turnover there. Um, and I think secondly, you know, they could benefit from the camaraderie of those groups. Bobby and I will post some information um, under the recording for this podcast. Um, and obviously, uh, please reach out to Arthur as well, too. Arthur, how about your everyday bias training? If I'm an employee and I'd love to go through that training, or if I'm a manager and I would like to get my team involved in that type of training, how do I go about doing that? Yeah, thank you. That's another great question. Um, everyone will have to take eventually take the everyday bias course. Um, when we came back from the first uh, class, the inaugurating class, um, we facilitated a training with our executive leadership team. And at the end of the training with the executive leadership and physician council, um, they all agreed that it was a competency that all of our employees should get. And so there are a few ways to um, have everyday bias training. Um, we have a list of trainings that you can go on to um, the online uh, goals area, um, and you could just check off the box and sign up there. Um, all the trainings are now virtual. The second is, is that you could reach out to Don or I um, and ask us to facilitate a training specifically to your department area. And then the last way is uh, we do have um, some open trainings that we do. Um, in fact, I'm going to be doing a uh, buffer training uh, for um, our area, uh, human resources, because many of us have already went through it in human resources. But we're so we're going to do kind of like a buffer trainer a reminder and then really uh, reinitiate the mitigating steps and then another exercise um, as a part of that. We also have a lot of new employees on our team. So I think that's it's going to be great, Arthur. It's nice that it's been virtual lately, too. I think that's been um kind of instrumental in opening up to the masses as well. So, you know, I think that's with a lot of logistics and attending classes in person is finding the time to travel or to uh, kind of step out, but makes it really convenient when you can just kind of switch over to the next meeting, right? And that meeting happens to be an awesome training on unconscious bias and everyday bias and how it's impacting your role in healthcare. So I think it just, it eliminates one more barrier for our population to just easily log in and participate. I was going to say, you're a trainer too, aren't you? I am. I've been a little quiet, haven't I? 
<laughs> yeah, I, I know so wondering. much about everyday bias because I am a trainer. <laughs> and by the way, you know, I always say this in our classes too. It makes perfect sense for, um, you know, individuals or professionals in the human resources field to, you know, be delivering and facilitating trainings, right? That's kind of been our background. Um, but we have um, facilitators who deliver that class who are in operations, who are physicians, who are nurses, um, nursing education. So it's been really cool to see the kind of cross-functional um, collaboration with um, kind of interprofessional backgrounds. Yeah, when I developed the rationale, I thought it was important to have people from all um, sects of the healthcare population. Um, number one, because they have social capital in their own areas. Number two, they will be able to facilitate it to the groups and uh, really speak to the imperatives and why it's important. Um, and then number three, I thought it would uh, probably be easier for us to get into areas um, because at that time we were really doing it face to face. And um, we know that it's really hard to get people, especially if they're um, fiscal income producing areas to really shut down for two and a half hours. Um, but I'll tell you, it's been um, a pleasure working in healthcare because um, everyone knows that it's so necessary to do. And so they figure out a way how to do it. So Arthur, here we are in February, Black History Month. Tell us what we're doing here at Geisinger and what you're excited about in celebration of Black History Month. Oh gosh, I'm excited about everything. I'd have to sit down and talk <laughs> about all the things. Um, how, you know, the Bold Group, um, along with the Education Committee, um, has done such a great job of putting together um, our second annual program. Um, I think the first thing that I want to say is, is that um, everyone should absolutely uh, view the documentary um, Black Men in White Coats. Um, that is going to be a wonderful opportunity where it's an experiential exercise um, where uh, Black men will tell you their um, experiences on being a physician um, in um, school, medical school, and then also their experience um, with uh, giving health care to patients. Um, there will be three opportunities to view it. Um, you do need to sign up. Um, you will get a special code. Um, that special code will allow you to watch um, the documentary anytime that you'd like. And I think it's about 80 minutes, 80 or 90 minutes. And then the last day, um, we will be facilitating a large discussion on it. So um, I'm encouraging people to kind of take down notes, just jot down things that, you know, you find um, that have hit you a certain way or an aha moment. Um, and then we'll be taking some questions, answers, and comments. The second thing that I am so, so excited about is, is that Fox 43 has reached out to us and they are going to be um, interviewing three of our physicians, uh, Dr. Stanley Martin, uh, Dr. Daryl McBride, and then Dr. Tatiana um, Jackson on um, the COVID vaccine in the minority community. Um, and, you know, it's hit the minority community um, tremendously. Um, for a lot of reasons. Um, one is because of the social determinants of health. Um, second is, is that um, the Black African American community are really um, part of the um, group that is highest in the service industry. Um, so they were our, um, you know, crucial workers working the front lines. Um, and then third, um, many of them had other issues, healthcare issues. Um, and so um, there's always been historical distrust um, with the community, uh, African American community, and the healthcare community. Um, and no more important time is it to um, break down the distrust and have um, frank conversations around it because the vaccine is so, so important for them to get because they don't want to be on the end of having the disease um, and getting it and then ending up in um, ICU and um, being intubated and everything else. And so how do you kind of do that? Um, these three physicians will um, facilitate that conversation. Um, and it will be on Fox 43. And I think we will also have some of the taped part of the interview on our um, internet um, at Geisinger. So that'll be exciting. That's and awesome. then there are a lot of others that are on there. 
um, that you will get the um, opportunity um, to just be a part of it. Um, and I, the one of the reasons why I like doing um, programming around specific groups because rarely do we really know the history. You know, I'm always aha about um, how much I don't even know about my own history. And my parents were really instrumental in always getting me every Christmas I got a book uh, about black history. I have every single one. Um, and they're always, they were always saying, hey, look, you may not learn it in school, but I want you to learn it here. Mm -hmm. And so part of that has always been kind of like my threshold. Mm -hmm. You know, even women's history, Native American history and everything else, um, because I was always taught um, he who forgets is doomed to repeat. My great grandmother, um, her name was Louise Brees, and um, they started the first black Baptist church in a storefront in um, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, where I live now. And wow. um, I remember people telling me when I was a little kid, um, your grandmother used to have something on her um, on her front door um, that would tell people when they came through Wilkes-Barre, wherever they were going, either they were going down south or up north, that they could come by for a meal. And I remember, you know, all these older people telling me this. I'm like, really, my grandmother? And uh, then I got to see her really do it in action. And um, when we used to have really large picnics at um, public parks, my grandmother would go to complete strangers and say to them, come over, eat, honey, we have a lot of food. I mean, she'd go over to all these people and my mother would sit there and say, hey, Louise, you know, we don't have much left. And she said, so what? Even if we don't have enough, I'll go home and make sandwiches or whatever. And I, when I think about this, I think like, why did she do this? Because number one, she didn't have a lot. Um, and then number two, you know, it was always more work, but she felt as though um, that that was something that she could give. You know, that's something that I could do um, for others. And even if it's just to get them to the next destination or give them whatever they need, they have the opportunity um, to do that. So um, I kind of believe, um, I've always said this to uh, my parents, that um, she passed the torch down to me because, you know, I've always been very passionate about social justice issues and um, all the other things. Um, you know, I'm not a good cook, um, but one of the things that I will do is stand up um, and to correct or um, things that have been wronged um, to write them for people and to make sure that you know, everyone has an equitable opportunity to succeed, whatever that looks like for people. I'm reading this great book. It's uh, by Dolly Chu. It's How to Be a Good Person and Fight Bias. I mean, it's just incredible, the book. In fact, I want to go see her, and I'm hoping that she's going to be out on the West Coast when I um, go out there. I'll figure out somehow a way. Um, but anyway, <laughs> she talks about two ways of addressing um, social justice issues. Um, and in the book, and she talks about the light um, version and the heat version. The light version is, um, you know, you center, um, comfort is at the center. So you don't really push people. Um, you know, you're more concerned about comfort. Um, you want to make sure that you're um, taking it slow and very methodical. Uh, approach. In, in fact, um, let me go back. Both versions are very, very important. The heat version is really, um, you don't care about, you don't center comfort. Um, you, it's very uncomfortable. Um, you're really pushing people to the max. Um, they're uh, like the folks that I remember um, when HIV came along and um, they would lay on the ground um, and do all kinds of demonstrations. And so she talks about these two. And she said that, you know, you're either in one or the other, um, but then you've got to kind of learn whatever one that you're not in um, and really value the one that you're not in. And, um, and then the one that you're in, they have to also value you. And I think it's so important that we understand that because for any kind of movement to be successful, you need those two areas, the light and the um, heat version. And um, 
I can't think of a time um, today in our social political climate that um, sometimes you don't really need to be out there and screaming because that's not part of your aurora. Um, but certainly you could be the light version and be there and stand behind and do things all kinds of behind the scenes. So I think my grandmother was kind of like that. And, and actually, I still remember my father. He would always say, be very careful. Don't show your anger. Um, and he was a breeze also. So um, my mother was definitely the heat. She said, if somebody does something to you, you just da, 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 da. And um, so the both of them have shown me this version. I've had both of them in my family, and I've seen both of them to be effective. But you got to get that book. It's just an incredible book um, that she writes about and talks. She also says, you know, you should try to be, stop trying to be a good person. Be goodish. Because if you want to be a good person, all of us believe we're a good person already. And then there's no room for improvement. Um, when you're a goodish person, you could see where you lack, you know, in certain areas. And really goodish gets us to be um, really challenging the biases that we have. Because all of us have biases, all of us have privileges. So this month is all about reflecting on our history, more specifically honoring Black history and the accomplishments of Black Americans. Arthur, you've talked about how you've had the opportunity to travel to Ghana in Africa, which is a place that plays a key historical role in the African-American slave trade. You've traveled there. I vicariously traveled there through, and I'll throw a pitch out there, um, the New York Times podcast 1619. If you haven't had a chance to download and listen to that, highly recommend it. But I guess where I'm going with this, Arthur, is we don't have to be in the place and the time to experience a moment or moments in time, do we? We can live them vicariously through reading, listening, honoring artifacts. What are your thoughts? There is a lot of opportunity, and I even think about the Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. um, I went to the Jewish Community Center. I live locally in uh, Wilkes-Barre, and mm -hmm. um, a Holocaust survivor came and talked about how they survived. And I was in total awe to think about how you could survive, you know, the Holocaust and live to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And it was just incredible to, I just felt like I was there that I was moving through it. Um, it's almost like a form of art. Um, that's why no one likes to go to an, uh, an art uh, museum with me because it takes me five hours, six hours, because I sit and look at them from all different angles and then I sit down and then I move to the left and to the right. And my brother said, how many times are you gonna look at that? And I said, well, every time I look at it, I see something different and it moves your emotions, you know, just like a Broadway play. Mm -hmm. um, I feel the same way. And when, especially when I think about Ghana um, in particular, because the second thing that I did, I had the opportunity to go on a, a safari. And uh, I did not want to go on a safari in an open um, uh, Jeep Wrangler. I was mm -hmm. terrified of it um, because they were taking us at five o'clock in the morning because they said, oh, that's when the tigers like to eat and they're hunting and everything else. And I said, I just can't. And so they said, well, you have two options. You can go on the Jeep Wrangler um, and they have people definitely with dart guns and all kinds of other things surrounding you. Um, the second thing is you could be an enclosed um, bus. And uh, it only took me probably about 15, 20 minutes to get on the enclosed bus. Um, I was on the Jeep Wrangler at first. And the first time, honest to God, that I heard a real lion roar, it was so loud that everything on the Jeep was shaking. I just said, oh my God, I got to get in the bus. And so I jumped up, got all my stuff, got right on the bus and I'm sitting there filming it, which I loved filming it behind because I felt much more comfortable. Um, but it was just incredible to be in their um, habitat and have all kinds of things happening. Um, and I happened to go during when they were doing the great migration. So they were going to where the water source was um, for the second time which wow. is just truly amazing. Yeah. Incredible. Arthur, can I ask you a question while we have you here? So I have heard a little bit about the Black Scranton Project and that we have a partnership, but I 
I'm going to be full disclosure. I don't know much about it. And I was wondering if you might be able to share a little bit more about that partnership and what's taking place there. So we have uh, two of our co-chairs um, from Bold, um, which is the Black Outreach Leadership uh, Development ERG. Um, one has been given a board seat, um, which is our very own Dr. Uh, Victoria Sapp. And so she is on the community engagement board and slash education. And so the Black um, Scranton Project has been very integral in um, telling the story of African Americans in um, Lackawanna County and how they came, um, what they did, how they existed, um, all kinds of different things. And um, this has been um, a, a dream of uh, Glendalen um, is her name. She is the uh, Black Scranton Project CEO. Um, all of it is volunteer. Um, so all the board members are volunteer. The CEO is volunteer. Nothing is being paid. So they do all kinds of different um, benefit things to come up with income, to continue, you know, keeping the, the lights on and doing education. And um, the School of Medicine students um, typically reach out to underserved communities. And the way they were able to reach out to the African-American community was through um, the uh, Black Scranton Project. So that bridge was really built for the students to reach out. And then it also was a wonderful opportunity for us to start connecting um, to communities where we treat those patients. And so now that um, kind of marriage now exists between us, which is really um, phenomenal that we have the opportunity to work with them. So given the political and racial climate as of late, many of our listeners are experiencing both, I would say, significant trepidation as well as feelings of hope. Um, so let's leave our listeners with some positivity about what we can expect in terms of our commitment to diversity and inclusion at Geisinger. So we are in a, a very interesting time in this country. Mm -hmm. Um, and I always believe in hope. If you don't have hope, you have nothing. Um, and I know that um, in Dolly Chu's um, book, she talks about believers and builders. And she says that believers only, you know, believe that something could happen, but they need something more uh, to build upon that for it to come to fruition. Um, and so the one thing that I think um, that um, for us to move from believing, especially with Geisinger, to be building, you know, we have a lot of things that we've implemented in place um, to, um, number one, commit to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then really uh, move us to, um, you know, King still having the dream to being the dream fulfilled. You know, one of the things I think we're doing great is, is that we've established a disparities health task force um, throughout the system. You know, really looking at, you know, populations, um, in particular underrepresented populations, the Hispanic, Latino, African American, figuring out where we have disparities, we know that we have them, and then doing education to reduce those numbers. I mean, that's making significant change. Second is, is that I have lobbied um, for the next person um, you know, um, for the board of uh, at Geisinger um, to um, recruit the next person to either be a Hispanic Latino community member or an African American. And I, mm -hmm. I'm saying that again because of underrepresented minorities, because mm -hmm. that voice has been absent and it's critical to have that at the board level. Um, third is, as you know, Grace, you know, we're doing a lot in terms of recruiting people. Yeah. So not only are we recruiting, you know, um, visibly in the county, but we're doing it nationally, mm -hmm. um, system-wide. And we put in all kinds of interesting things into place to ensure that we get a diverse applicant pool. So it's more of, you know, we're now, we've often been able to talk the talk, but we're starting to walk the walk. And, um, you know, we may not see it. Um, my mother would always say this to probably, you know, get me all teary eyed because she would always say that when, you know, my hope was starting to fail. She said, you are planting seeds for trees you may never 
see grow, but they will be growing beyond belief, you know, if you're here or you're not here. So you should be proud of all the seeds that you've left all over the world. And um, I, I just think that I've been incredibly blessed to have this opportunity. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, you can find this podcast, Life at Geisinger, on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to your favorite shows. To get access to our freshest content and never miss an episode, please search for us and subscribe. You can also find us on Yammer Community by searching Life at Geisinger, all one word, podcast. We'll be sure to post notes from today's episode on Yammer and look forward to connecting with you in that space.